Just waiting a moment for someone to join me as we get started today. <clears throat> All right, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Take Another Look. I know that as some are starting to join, others will join as we get going here. Uh, so if you want to get your Bible or your... Um, your iPad, or if you're at your computer, or you want to take notes, or just get your cup of coffee and listen, uh, we're about to teach. Uh, so good morning, uh, my, my brother uh, Kob is from South Africa. Um, praise the Lord. So anyway, good to see everybody joining us this morning. This is going to be good uh, today. And so let me just... Uh, uh, say it this way, that if you've never watched Take Another Look before, uh, this is lesson number 162, over three years of scripture by scripture in the book of Revelation, verse by verse. And um, this is an ongoing series where we're taking this, this spiritual journey through the book of Revelation, verse by verse. And I'm sharing with you what I believe Holy Spirit has shown me and is showing me. And, you know, the reality is, is that I call this a spiritual journey because for me, this started out as a spiritual journey and that the Lord led me into the book of Revelation, although I had taught the book of Revelation um, uh, uh, periodically and especially the first few chapters and and so on. Uh, but I've read the book of Revelation multiple times and. Uh, it became a spiritual journey for me, an unveiling. Uh, the book of Revelation is called, uh, uh, in the translation, for me at least, it's the unveiling of the anointed one. And so as we look at this revelation, we're seeing what the Apostle John experiences as he, as we look at the events surrounding uh, his his experience in a new dimension of the heavenly fa uh, heavenly realms of the Father's mind, and we're seeing what we can learn from that. And so, you know, as uh, Jesus gave this to John in his awareness, we are seeing truth unveiled in these lessons. And so, uh, uh, just again, good morning to everyone. There's Linda Routley, one of our students from WBSU, and um, and the others will join as we get going. Now. Uh, let's continue this morning as we see what John sees and hears next as he shows us how to operate from a heavenly realm mindset uh, while ministering in this earthly realm. Good to see uh, Chaplain Shane Gabbert joining us this morning. Um, so let's get started today. Revelation 19 verse 20 and 21. And the reason I'm doing these two verses together, and sometimes I'll do two or three verses that have a, a flowing context, but it's because we touched on Revelation 20, uh, 19, verse 20 last week. And so we're going to finish up verse 20 and then uh, finish up verse 21. And then next week we'll move into Revelation chapter 20. And so it says from the New King James says, then the beast was captured. So that's an important point right there that we understand that as John is seeing this revelation unveiled to him in a symbolic way, uh, if, if you don't get Revelation 1 verse 1, you'll not get the rest of the book. Uh, it'll really challenge your, uh, your understanding. But uh, as we look at this, it's important to catch the idea that the beast is captured. So John's seeing this unfold to him. And what he's getting is, is the things that are being done in spirit symbolically, but have come to a place of culmination, which we saw, I believe it was chapter 18, where, where the Babylonian mindset uh, was destroyed. And I can't go back there and explain all of that. But here, the beast was captured. And with him, with the beast, the false prophet who works signs and wonders in his presence. Uh, presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. Remember, the beast was captured, so those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Whose image? The image of the beast. What image are we talking about? Well, there was an image in Rome uh, of, of Nero. Uh, it's, uh, Nero was the sixth emperor of Rome. And so at this point, we're talking about the image being the uh, the Roman emperors of that day. Uh, the, these two were cast. So what two were cast? It was the beast 
with the false prophet were cast into the lake of, of fire uh, burning with brimstone. Verse 21, and the rest were killed. So everything else involved in this mindset was killed or destroyed. We look at killed as death, but we don't look at killed sometimes as something that was destroyed. In this case, a mindset is destroyed. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. So if he's killed with a sword that proceeds from the mouth, we know it's not a physical slashing sword, but there's something happening with words, with declarations. And all the birds were filled uh, filled with their flesh. So we saw that back in verse 19. All right, now let's go on. Last time we looked at how the beast and the false prophet represented the voice within the unrenewed soul, which have prophesied to our thoughts the false realities of this natural realm awareness. Keep in mind, you are a spirit being. You are a supernatural being. Everything in this natural realm is a perception of one thing or another. It's something we perceive, something we determine by the sensory realm. Everything that is of the sensory realm is subject to change, right? Everything changes, okay? But everything in the supernatural realm is eternal. It is present tense and it is eternal. And so we looked at how the beast and the false prophet, this voice within the unrenewed soul. But I also mentioned, just as we were closing last week's lesson, that there is also another voice within the human condition or the human consciousness known as the voice of the creator within. And he has been speaking to us as spirit to spirit, and we hear his voice. Notice these verses from 1 John 3, verse 9 in the New King James, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Let's get another look at that from the Passion Translation this time. It says, everyone who is truly God's child uh, will refuse to keep any keep sinning because God's seed remains within him. And he is unable to continue sinning because he has been fathered by God himself. First of all, when we read the Bible, we read the Bible as if it was written yesterday or it was written first thing this morning. But the Bible was not written first thing this morning, and it was not written in the language you're reading it in unless you have an original copy of the Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic languages of the day, and you understand them fluently, not only how to read them, but in their meanings as you read them. And so when we read this, we think this is talking about me right now, that if I'm really born of God, I'll refuse to keep sinning. But here's the thing. This is talking about a concept uh, from the first century. And so what he's saying, this is, is, a, is an, an other, in other words, uh, scenario. He's saying your true identity as spirit does not operate from a place of mistaken identity. All right. So I want you to hear that. You as spirit. So when the Bible is addressing you, if it's talking about the man of the flesh, uh, he's talking about the mindset that the flesh operates in. But as he's talking about you as spirit, that is the, the context of the book because you're a spiritual being. And if God is speaking to you, he's speaking to you as spirit to spirit so that you will hear his voice and you will follow suit with that voice. Now, following suit with the voice of God that speaks to you as spirit to spirit will influence any fleshly or carnal perception that you have, and it will ultimately be changed. And so he's saying that your true identity as spirit does not operate from a place of mistaken identity. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is, is because God's seed remains within him. So just I'm not agreeing with with whatever your concept of sinning is. Let's just take something like uh, murdering some blatantly murdering someone. You go out, you break into someone's home, you take your gun, you shoot them. We call that sinning, right? Well, there's a name for that sinning. It's also called murder. But the thing about it is, is that 
God's seed remains in you as spirit to spirit, even if you in your flesh, in your carnal perception of things become confused, become angry. You do this thing that you should not have done and you sin. Okay, so the Bible is saying that if you get the idea that the seed of God remains in you, it will stop you from sinning. Now, let's also look at it this way, that the word sin, hamartia, means mis to be mistaken or mistaken identity. So if you are sinning, you're doing it because you have an identity that is in error. You're not understanding that you are not uh, in no way separated from the love of God. And so the Aramaic can be translated to say that he never sins or serves a false identity. The Greek word for seed here is sperma. And, and I'll pronounce these as close as I can in the, in the Greek and or Hebrew language, a sperdeba, which means male seed. So to be born of God does not refer to born again. That concept of born again in first John, in John chapter three is a whole uh, a section of scripture that is completely misunderstood. It's not about being born again, okay? But let me just say it this way. Being born of God does not refer to born again, but it refers to ganao, uh, as in created or fathered by God, your creator God himself. And we carry his DNA and his genes. So if you sin, I'm not suggesting that you go out and do a bunch of sins. I'm not suggesting that at all. Matter of fact, I would discourage that. But what I am saying is that if you do, it's done from a place of mistaken identity. So the thing we want to understand is, is that you carry this DNA of God, you carry his genes, the male seed is an expression of fatherhood and everything that God is remains in you as spirit to spirit. But if your carnal mind, if your unrenewed mind doesn't get it, it will not connect to the fact that God's seed remains in you. First Corinthians 7 verse 37 in the New King James says, Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin does well. Now, this is not talking about if you have a daughter that is a virgin that you keep her safe from any sexual contact. That's not talking about that at all. This is talking about something else. So let's break this down as we look, first of all, that to keep his heart, the word heart uh, used here is the Greek word kardia, uh, meaning the thoughts or feelings or the mind. Therefore, this sentence says, has so determined in his heart or mind that he will keep his virgin, implying that there is a portion of the soul that is untouched by the human experience. This portion is referred to as the virgin soul or the mind or thoughts. So think about that. We have this virgin area in our soul. So we're spirit, soul, body. Body is the physical expression of what you as a soul uh, uh, understand or are awakened to. And you have that virgin area in your soul that is untouched, that, that God, uh, his knowledge resides in. But you also are spirit and spirit speaks to soul and speaks to that virgin part of your soul, which then floods out or, or eats up everything that is unrenewed. And then that, of course, affects the uh, natural realm or the body realm. Uh, so there had to have been something in your soul that was untouched, which was able to receive from spirit, uh, the spirit of truth of the father's mind. So we receive from spirit to spirit and we we hear God. All right, let's notice one more verse before we move on. Uh, Revelation 14, verse 4 in the New King James says, These are the ones who were not defiled by defiled with women, for well, they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Keep in mind that the disciples were not what you would call born again. The disciples were uh, had a, 
area of their soul that was virgin that caused them to be able to follow this guy that was saying some stuff that was completely opposed to their Jewish roots or their Jewish upbringing, yet they followed him. So in the original language, the word for soul is the Greek word suke, suke. And I, and I know it sounds like psyche, but it's really not. It's And it's not really suke, but in the Greek and, and, and uh, uh, Hebrew, this K and H together in the enunciation would be suke. And is often used in the feminine form, while spirit is used in the masculine form. And so even in the word spirit that can be interchangeable with soul, you have to know when it's speaking about the masculine or the feminine, even though being gender specific about some things is not the important point. Now, here in Revelation 14, where it states not being defiled with the woman or the soul, would be like not allowing the feminine side to operate in and of itself, but being subject to spirit within. Dr. K. Fairchild says, I think the virgin consciousness on our left side is the part of our awareness, which is fertile for the seed of God's word. So we're talking about the left side, right side of the brain as a metaphor for the soul and spirit. So it's just a metaphor. But the fact is, is that that left side uh, part of our awareness is the fertile part, the feminine part that is able to, that is, stands ready to receive the seed of God's word. Therefore, it's a matter of always having some degree of conscious awareness or some degree uh, of uh, uh, conscious awareness of someone greater than ourselves, such as God, even if one was not aware of who God was. You may not have known God. You may not have been taught about God, but there was a part of you that was des desiring or even aware of someone greater than yourself. Amen. Okay. Now <clears throat> that has been the condition of the soul of mankind for thousands of years, yet it remains a personal choice as to how long remain one remains in such a condition. So change is inevitable, change is necessary. Now, mankind in his unrenewed state of mind does not always know how to respond to the Father's voice, okay? So this is a picture painted by the concept of the mark of the beast, so I want you to hear this because that was mentioned in verse number uh, 20 and 21. The concept of the mark of the beast or the mindset of thought demanded from the Roman government rule in the first century as opposed to trusting in the teachings of Jesus. So think about this as we looked at these scriptures and I, I don't have it pulled up uh, per se this morning, but I'm going to right now uh, because I want us to get this uh, down pat here, uh, what we're talking about uh, in Revelation 19. And <coughs> as we look at this, so it says, uh, then the beast was captured and, the, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, which by which he deceived the whole, uh, deceives uh, who, he deceived those who receive the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. So think about this. There were six emperors in Rome, seven total, but the sixth emperor and the last emperor, the seventh, uh, didn't last a long time. He wasn't in rule. I, I think it was just, you know, maybe, uh, maybe even just a very short time, maybe less than a year, maybe just over a year, right in that. But, but the sixth emperor of Rome, as we're talking about the beast, because these emperors were known as the beast. And I know I'm going to get into this more, but 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 just let's just get this, that mankind in his unrenewed state does not always know how to respond to Father's voice within. And so as we look at this picture of the mark of the beast, this concept, we've got to realize that the mark of the beast is a branding or a convincing of the voice of religion within from the mind of unrenewed or underdeveloped thinking. 
Now, I know a lot of people want to believe that the mark of the beast is a literal branding where they're going to take a branding iron and brand people on their forehead or on their right hand. And keep in mind that when we talk about the forehead, we're talking about the mind as symbolically. OK, and since the book of Revelation is a symbolic book, we're talking about the symbolism here. But we're also talking about the right hand, which is if the mind is hindered or if your thinking is hindered, your right hand, which was always known as the hand of blessing. Uh, symbolically that if the mind is hindered the hand of blessing will be hindered or that which you can touch someone with and so as we talked about this last time the lake of fire is symbolic of all those strongholds that were consumed by the consuming fire of the father's passionate pursuit of his creation just because god created you and you came into this natural realm, you now have a natural sensory realm awareness. Just because you have that doesn't mean, and, and you forgot about God, doesn't mean that God will not pursue you because you are his, his creation and he has a loving passion for you. Amen. And so that's how Father God works within the unrenewed thoughts of mankind, which is passionate, which is to passionately um persuade us in our thinking to trust him as our creator father. So the lake of fire, it uh, 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 was what the first century historian, as I mentioned last time, uh, the first uh, century historian Josephus saw as Jerusalem burned and was destroyed by fire and blood in AD 70. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, now, the, as the creation of the creator faces a, a, a course correction in our own minds, okay, that's us. We're, we, are, we have been uh, receiving a course correction in our thinking. Uh, those unrenewed thoughts are cleansed. They're corrected. They're delivered. They're purified. They're refined just like gold is refined in the furnace or of a refiner's fire. Writer and commentator uh, J. Preston Eby says, let us consider with care the order of events we see in this portion of the revelation. This is also so very vital to our understanding of the purpose and working of God in these days. In chapter 17 and 18 of the revelation, we are shown the destruction of the mystery Babylon the Great. Uh, immediately following that in the verses First verses of chapter eight, uh, chapter nineteen, we see the virgin bride of the Lamb displayed in her wedding, uh, in entering into her ultimate union and glory with Christ the Lord. Babylon is God. The true bride is fully uh, joined fully to the Lord. Uh, but the beast of the, the, the of world government still exists, as well as the false prophet the spiritual mis ministries uh, that pre uh, prevail previously were in Babylon. In the chapters before us, God deals with the nation and the nations are saved and made to walk in the light of the city of God, which is the bride of the lamb and the sons of God as God's government revealed on earth. Keep in mind, you are God's government revealed on earth. Before the new Jerusalem can be revealed in all its glory, which we'll see in the upcoming chapters, and before the nations can be saved to walk in the light of it, something wonderful must happen. God must deal with both human government and false prophet, uh, the, and the false prophet. So what does he do? The answer is not far to be found. It's right here in our text. And the beast of human government was taken, and with him the false prophet, the church as a religious organism that wrought miracles before him, uh, with which he deceived them that had received a branding of the mark, the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast in, uh, cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Look, I want to tell you something. If change must come to you after you die from this physical realm, you no longer experience this physical sensory realm, uh, then so be it. But that's really not God's ultimate plan. You know, when my father passed away, I came home from the memorial and I heard the spirit of, uh, I heard my God, I uh, heard my dad speak 
from the unseen realm. And he said, oh man, I could have stayed. He came into an awareness that a place of a correction in his thinking that he didn't have completely developed here in this earthly realm. So the fact is, is that this is some of what John saw in his vision that we just read to you, which shows us how we move from a flesh-minded rule up to a spirit-minded rule within our oneness with the eternal Christ, who is the hope of glory within, as God's fire burns out all unrenewed thinking, which does not belong. And keep in mind that the, the, the mentioned human government in the first century, again, refers to the government entities of Rome and even the pressures of that the Pharisees were placing on the church of the first century. So this does not refer to the government of our day. I want to say this to you. We talk about the government a lot. And when we talk about the government, we're not talking about the president of the United States, or we're not talking about foreign leaders. We're not talking about the government of the land. We're talking about the government of the 21st, of the first century. It's not the government in our day of the 21st century, but it is the governing rule within which speaks of unrenewed or underdeveloped thinking. Now, let's notice Revelation 19, verse 20 and 21 from the Amplified Bible. It says, and the beast, now the Amplified prefaces beast with Antichrist, which I'll explain that in just a moment, uh, was seized and overpowered, and with him the false prophet, who in his presence had performed amazing signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Those who were those two were hurled alive into the lake of fire, which blazes with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds fed ravenously uh, and gorged themselves with their flesh. All right, now. Let's start with the word Antichrist because Antichrist is used here as a reference to beast uh, of that day, the beast of that day, which points to the Roman emperors of the first century, as I've already mentioned. By this casting, but this casting into the lake of fire was symbolic of those mindsets within mankind being consumed by the Father's passionate love. I want you to understand there was a practical uh, display of a lake of fire, which the historian Josephus again, and not only Josephus, but other historians, saw the blood running through the streets. And you'll see that mentioned in scripture. And, 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 and when he saw that, as thousands and thousands and thousands of people uh, were killed. I can't tell you how many. I would just make an, an uneducated guess and say, you know, probably 10,000 people or more. But the fact is, is that all these people were killed, 6,000 in the temple and then the soldiers and et cetera, and those out in the streets and so on. And they say that as the blood ran through the streets, that it days or weeks later is what quenched the fire fire uh, uh, that was going on, but but it was referred to as the lake of fire. Now, uh, re remember that in the very first chapter of the book of Revelation, we find the glorious Christ standing in the midst of the churches and his eyes are as a flame of fire. Revelation 1, 14 says his head and hair were white like wool and white as snow and his eyes were like a flame of fire. Let's read another uh, a large piece of commentary by writer and commentator J. Preston Neve. The Christ's eyes of fire and the eyes of every of 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 fire of every son of god who shares his glory are eyes of the very same fire that is revealed throughout the book of revelation there are not two or five or ten different fires they are there are his eyes of fire and there is a gold that is tried or refined by the fire and and it is the same fire the fire of god uh, the fire of the golden altar, which is cast into the earth by the same uh, holy refining fire of God. And when it is cast into the earth, um, mighty commotions take place. The fire of the golden altar is, of course, taken from the fire of the brazen altar. And this is the fire that was kindled by God himself. It is his divine fire, the consuming fire, which he is. 
uh, by that fire, all carnality is consumed from every son of man, uh, that God might be glorified in the earth realm, even as he is in the heavenlies. Uh, there are seven lamps of burning, of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So we know that this is the same divine fire. These seven, spirit, uh, seven spirits of God, uh, these seven uh, spirits or lamps of fire of God are also seen forth into all the earth or sent forth into all the earth. It is not clear that the work of the seven lamps of fire sent into all the earth, uh, but, but another picture of fire from the altar that is cast into the earth. Is it the same fire? It is the same fire. And as the fi lamp of fire on these, this occasion, it brings spiritual illumination by consuming the veil that lies over men's minds and hearts. The lamp has seven eyes and seven ears, uh, seven, seven eyes and uh, ha the lamp has, the lamb has seven eyes and the seven eyes are the seven fold spirit of God. Thus they are likewise the eyes of fire, which are also the seven lamps burning before the throne. Now, why that's necessary is just a piece of commentary to show us that there is a consistency about the fire, but it is the same fire. So the consuming fire of God's passion of love or his passionate love for all of his creation is the same fire mentioned in the book of Revelation, uh, We, but we simply see different administrations or ways that it is administered. And in Revelation 15, we saw a sea of glass mingled with fire and a people who became within themselves as an untroubled sea of tranquility and peace. So where there was confusion and chaos, that was transformed by what? By this sea of glass mingled with fire. And you'd have to go back to Revelation 15 to kind of catch that. So living in the person of the eternal Christ, who is your peace, can only be done through the processing God's fire of, uh, of compassion within. Now, whether we like it or not, and whether everybody believes it or not, there is a processing that takes place. That's the processing where we went from thinking one thing many years ago and transitioned slowly into where we are today, thinking and believing something else. All of the restlessness, all of the agitation of the carnal, unrenewed mind has been taken away. And yet, as you are awakened to it, you are uh, you also experience the reality of all that was finished for you. So when we talk about it is finished, it's not just a it is finished statement and that's the end. No, it is finished and it's still being finished. Or in other words, I am awakening to that which is finished. So traditionally. Religious ideology paints a picture of the lake of fire for all of God's adversaries. Now, the problem with this, the problem is that mankind has learned to uh, look outwardly for adversaries. And so religion painted a picture of a devil uh, for the mind to target and identify with. You have to understand the Greek word for devil is diabolos. And it's it's a, a traducer. Uh, we've had uh, we've had the law in our minds or unrenewed thinking that becomes a traducer or traduces over what we have believed. And in reality, it's it's important that we understand that religion has painted this picture so that we would believe one thing and thus avoid another reality of truth. So uh, the only real adversaries of God are the unrenewed thoughts within the soul of mankind. Therefore, that which is destroyed or changed by fire is unrenewed thinking. I mean, that is so important. That's so powerful. And we really have got to get this this morning, folks. All right. So what we got to understand is that this lake, uh, which burns with fire and brimstone, is the consuming fire of God. Unveiled uh, unveiling his true passion of love toward us so that no thoughts of separation remain. What do you think God is after? I mean, really, what do you think Father God creator is after? He's after uh, you 
thinking everything that he thinks, that the unveiling of who he is and, and what's in his mind unveiled you, which is a limited, massive amount of knowledge. And God wants you to know that. God wants you to believe that. And so he's after every area that is unrenewed within us. So when we know that his love was shed abroad in, or in is the, the Greek word in or into uh, the heart or mind, the thoughts of heaven become evident there. Did you hear what I just said? We know that his love was shed abroad, E-N, the Greek, into, meaning into the heart or mind, the thoughts of heaven become evident there. That's what's going on. The thoughts of heaven are becoming evident. All right. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> so with all that had uh, held mankind captive in the chains of darkness in our thoughts are burned away by Father's love and passion, we begin to see him as he is, and his supernatural reality breaks down the veil of a lack of understanding. Why would a veil of a lack of understanding be broken down? Well, the reason would be is so that there would be understanding, right? And so that's what his love does. Now, uh, so who cast the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire? All right, because this has been a big issue throughout years as people read and study the book of Revelation. Well, it is, now get ready for this because I know you're looking for God to, to thunder and lightning and, and the clouds to roll back and lightning to strike the earth and for God to cast this, this beast and false prophet into a lake of fire. But here's what happens. Each individual who makes a conscious decision to embrace the revelation of the Father's mind, uh, uh, who that we are awakened to our true selves in God, it is us who does that. It's we who choose to rid ourselves of these, these this wrong thinking. And, and these are son and these sons of God, also known as saints of God, was and is given authority to baptize men with Holy Spirit fire, as well as to cast them into a great lake of fire and brimstone, which is another way of saying the lake of fire is our God. And he burns out the unrenewed separation mindset that came out of the Adamic, uh, the Adam in the garden from his mind or from the minds or souls of mankind's thoughts. We got to get that Adamic thinking out of us, uh, his ways, his passions, and will this come and and, and will, so it's our, our mindsets, our, our, our thoughts, our ways, our passions, our will uh, that are contrary and therefore hostile to the will of God. An act of that judgment is the casting of men into the lake of fire. There's no literal physical casting. Let me say that again. There is no literal physical casting of people into a lake that burns with fire and brimstone. It's not happening. It's not going to happen. This is a metaphor. Remember, if you don't understand Revelation 1 verse 1, you'll miss all of this stuff because it tells us how that he sent and signified it. And the word signified means this is a symbolic book. So we got to look at the symbolism here. So when we're talking about men being cast into the lake of fire, we're talking about our unrenewed thinking, the thing that represents humanity. So yet it is through the preaching, teaching, and sharing of the good news that is the vehicle used to cast them or bring them into the light of truth. Now, remember that the Bible said Jesus cast out the spirits with the word. The, the word cast out there really can be translated to say he changed. And the word spirits can actually be translated to say mindsets. Again, we're talking about the context there. So as Jesus preaches, he's changing mindsets of, that are in people. And so that's what happens. We hear preaching. We hear teaching. We hear the sharing of the good news. If it's wrong stuff, it reinforces those strongholds or those mindsets. But as truth invades the unrenewed mind, in a sense, those words of preaching and teaching are used as a vehicle to cast out 
those thoughts and bring us into the light of truth. A, a real short statement by writer and commentator J. Preston Neve. He says, the sons of God will send decrees to individuals. Now, let me stop there because I want to read this, this paragraph here. But sons of God send decrees. So we make decrees. We prophesy to our own souls, not the false prophet voice within us any longer, but the voice of the spirit that is causing our soul to be renewed to the truth of the father's mind. So we prophesy or we make decrees to our unrenewed thoughts, but also we prophesy or make decrees to individuals, to rulers, to authorities, to institutions, to armies, to church systems, to governments, to nations, and we'll, uh, we will even send commands to the elements as our Lord did when he spoke to the winds and the waves, hushing the gale and calming the waters with his word. Not his written word, not picking up a Bible and taking the Bible and then, you know, and, and, and no, it was what he spoke as spirit to spirit and he spoke out. So very important that we understand that. Now, it is by our union with the eternal Christ within the one riding on the white horse with the many membered body of the one. So it's not just Christ on the white horse, but it's everyone because as he is so are we we're united as one so as christ is riding again symbolically you're not going to get on a white horse and ride and and do all these things but as the many membered body of the one the head and the body are one right uh that all these things and many more have happened and are happening that produces great glory in other earth dwellers the Passion Translation says the wild beast and the false prophet were both thrown alive into the lake of fire burning with sulfur. Now, sulfur used in the Passion Translation or in other translations also is translated brimstone. And brimstone is also known as sulfur and is used as a divine incense and as regarded as having the power to purify. Whoa, if you look at the lake of fire, literally, you will not see the lake of fire being a place of purifying anybody because once something is purified, then we can get it out of there and it becomes useful, right? That's not happening if you're looking at this in a literal sense. So when you take the word uh, uh, sulfur or brimstone used as a divine incense, and it's regarded as having the power to purify. That's what's happening to our unrenewed thinking. They're being purified, redeemed. How about this one? Our unrenewed thinking is being saved or born from above, changed, transformed, so that they will think as your spirit thinks. Revelation 19, verse 21 in the Passion Translation says, and their armies were killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the white horse. Who's riding on the right white horse? Christ is, but so are you. It's a symbol of, it's symbolic of the many membered body of the one, both the head and the body all united as one, right on the white horse. And we make declarations to the unrenewed soul with a sharp sword that comes from our mouth. Uh, and, and, and then he says, and all the birds gorge themselves with their flesh. So these birds are symbolic of these flying thoughts that as they're released, all of this unrenewed junk is being renewed or changed or transformed. The reason people are emotionally feeling stress, uh, stress or frustrated within their minds. I, I want to just give you this in closing and tell you what's next. The reason people are emotionally feeling frustration within their minds is father's love is stretching us to see a new dimension of our true selves in the light of the mirrored reflection of father God. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. There is a change, and we're seeing the mirrored reflection of the Father. When you look in the mirror, you might see yourself. But what you should be seeing when you look in the mirror, and it's not done through the physical perception. It's done through the, the eyes of the mind, not the brain, but the soul. You see the Father. That's what's going on.
Oh, my goodness. Next week, we're going to move to Revelation chapter 20. Amen. So as this new covenant remnant of the eternal Christ continues to emerge and, and be unveiled to this generation around us, we are bringing healing and order to the chaos in God's creation. So we're going to have to be willing to change as God begins to speak to us and his passionate love draws us into new ideas and new revelation. And so once again, I ask you the question because we're not done with this. This is lesson 162. We'll move next week to lesson 163. Uh, are you ready for what's next? I've asked that. This is one, the 162nd time. Are you ready for what's next? Because the next thing that's coming, amen, is a continuation of change. That's right. That's where we're at. A continuation of change from old, uh, transforming from old mindsets of religious ideology uh, into the fresh unveiled perceptions of the Godhead, revealing sons and daughters of God who operate out of the Christ mind within. So look, uh, stick with me on this journey as we continue to see more of the unveiling of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look, it's time to embrace heaven's mindset right now in this life so that we can experience heaven on earth. Amen. I hope you got something out of this lesson today. Uh, if you did, please click like, then click share, and uh, uh, let somebody else know that uh, something good is going on, that there is a, a fresh revelation, that we're taking another look at the book of Revelation to see what John really saw, what he understood, so that we can participate in all of that knowledge. Amen. I'll see you next time. Join me tomorrow night, Dr. Michael Porter, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time on Kingdom Dynamics. Friday morning, Gil and Adina Hodges will be with me back for part two on uh, the courts of heaven as we talk more about these things. I'll see you then. Have a wonderful day. Don't forget on Saturday, Saturday morning, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, uh, it, WBSU is holding its online graduation due to the lockdown situation. We're not able to travel to uh, the places we need to go to. So we are literally, um, we are literally uh, going to have an online graduation. Join us there. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. We'll see you then. Bye-bye everyone.